Welcome for the first part of the introduction to my operations management course. Operations management is a survey course, so this will sound like it jumps around a lot because basically it introduces a bunch of different topics. So basically it does jump around a lot. Operations management can be defined as the management of systems or processes that create goods and or deliver services. In other words, you manage the process of manufacturing goods or delivering services. Operations is a function or system that transforms inputs into outputs of greater values, or at least hopefully of greater value. Most operations management textbooks break down an organization into either three or four basic functions. They all include finance, operations, and marketing. Some textbooks also include HR as the fourth function, but not all do. An important term in operations management is value added. Value added is the difference between the cost of the inputs and the value or price of the outputs. So if you take $100 worth of inputs and turn it into $150 worth of outputs, you've created $50 of value added. The greater your value added, the higher your profits. The greater the value added, in addition, the tougher it is for competitors to enter your market. On the screen, you see a diagram of a production system showing inputs and outputs. This is sometimes called a 5P diagram because it has planning, people, production, plant, and process. For a lot of production systems, labor is a big input. Call it people to make it 5Ps. Another big input is inventory, called parts to make it a P. I've shown it here as going through inventory because you might be buying stuff from another company and storing it in inventory before you use it, or you might partially complete your production process put that in inventory, it's called work and process inventory, and then finish it later. On the output side, I show it, it going two different ways. One is you're selling it to the customer, so it leaves your factory and it gets transported to the customer. Either you transfer title of it from you to the customer at your loading dock or at their loading dock. I also show it going into inventory. This is where you finish it, but you haven't sold it yet. So at some point in the future, you will take it out of inventory and sell it to the uh, customer. Just because I have a Georgia Power background, I've shown utilities as an input. That's not typically shown. There are a few industries where utilities are the biggest cost of operation or one of the bigger ones. Shown on the screen is a simple diagram of a supply chain. But basically, it's just showing you how things come into an organization. So you buy stuff from a lot of different companies. We'll end up calling that your supply chain. And then you sell stuff typically to other companies, the vast, vast majority of companies sell to other companies as opposed to the end consumer. So our inputs are the outputs of another company, typically. There are exceptions like a mining company. And our outputs are typically inputs to other companies unless we happen to sell to consumers. So a more formal definition of a supply chain is a sequence of activities and organizations involved in producing and delivering a good or service. This is sometimes used in a confusing way. We call it a supply chain when it's all of the organizations that get the stuff to you. When we talk about all the organizations that get the stuff to the end consumer or the end user, we call it a value chain. For some companies, the supply chain can be fairly simple, but for most companies, it's long, complex, and involved. I have seen supply chain maps in rooms where the map covered multiple walls in the room, so they can get very, very complex for a company like General Motors or a, a pharmaceutical company. So let's just talk a little bit about a supply chain for bread. And this is just a small part of it. I'm not mentioning all the pieces of it. So the farmer grows the wheat. That's the beginning of the process. So that's where the value chain for bread starts. Or so you think. But the farmer has to buy seeds. They have to buy diesel. They have to buy fertilizer. And lots of other things it takes to run a farm. Once the farmer has the wheat harvested, they load it on a truck to take it to the mill. The trucker that's doing the moving has to buy diesel, they have to buy tires and engine oil, and all of the things that it takes to keep a truck running. When it gets to the mill where it's turned from wheat into flour, the mill has to buy energy, bags to put the flour in, and if it's going to a bakery, it gets put in a great big bag, not the small one you buy at the grocery store. They have to buy hydraulic fluid to keep their equipment running, and lots of other things. Another trucker, or maybe the same trucker, but a trucker then takes it to a baker. They have the same inputs as the first trucker. The baker needs, as a minimum, eggs, oil, salt, and then they need bags and twist ties to, to bag up the bread with. They may have other inputs that they use. They may make flavored breads where they need to have flavoring. They may put nuts and stuff on the top of the bread that they need those things. A trucker, again, takes the bread to the grocery store. They also have to buy all of the things that they sell at that grocery store, not just bread. 
Plus, they also need cleaning supplies, sanitation supplies, and all of the other things that it takes to run a grocery store. So as you can see, the value chain for bread is fairly complex, and I've only talked about a small piece of it. There are some issues that supply chains face. I'm going to briefly mention these. We will talk about them in more detail when we talk about supply chains. Number one is global supply chain risk. For example, the meltdown of the Fukushima reactor in Japan. Number two, the need to improve operations. In other words, get more for less out of your supply chain. Number three, the increasing level of outsourcing that you see companies going through. For example, Apple making most of its products in China. Number four, increasing transportation costs. We're seeing a temporary respite from this with the lower oil prices, but they will continue to go up again. Number five, more competitive pressures. Number six, and this is a big one, the increasing globalization. And that's not just us going out and outsourcing to Japan and China and Mexico and Canada, but it's also those companies that are in those countries coming in and competing with us in this country. The increasing importance of e-commerce, Amazon and the like, uh, and that's really coming to the forefront with the COVID-19, where so much more is being bought online, and that trend will continue. Supply chains getting more complex just because of the outsourcing. Last but not least, the need to manage inventories to keep prices down, to keep inventory holding costs down. The process of operations is a transformation process, as I mentioned earlier, taking inputs and turning them into outputs, where hopefully those outputs have greater value. On the screen, I've listed two different transformation processes, just to give you an example. We've talked about the baker already. They take the raw ingredients, the flour, the eggs, the butter, and all of their other ingredients, and they transform them into bread. So their inputs are these raw ingredients. Their outputs are bags of bread. Now, in terms of the processing, they have to mix ingredients. They have to knead the dough. They have to wait and let the dough rise. It's called proofing. They have to shape and form it, put it in a pan. Uh, they have to proof it again in the pan. They bake it. They have to let it cool. They have to slice it if it's sliced bread. Then they have to package it. That's all of the transformation processes that it goes through. And it's oftentimes difficult to imagine just all of the steps that it takes to take these raw ingredients and turn them into uh, finished products for that company. Now, they may be inputs to another company, but for this particular company, they're a finished product. Another example is a dairy. They get truckloads of raw milk from farms. They have to get plastic to make their containers out of, or they have to get the containers made them uh, somewhere else and brought in. And if they're also packaging in cardboard uh, packaging, they have to either get the materials to make those on site or get the packages brought in. They have to test the incoming milk to make sure it meets their standards. They have to pasteurize. They have to homogenize. They have to separate cream and milk. And they have to package. Those are the processes that they go through. In terms of output, they've got small things of milk, medium-sized things of milk, large things of milk, both in plastic and paper. They may also make ice cream and other milk products. We tend to think of goods and services as two separate categories. They're not. They exist on a continuum. For example, a steel mill and a dairy are all goods. They, there's little to no service involved. But if you buy a Honda or a Ford, it's mostly manufacturing, but they have to service your car. If you buy a Dell computer, they manufacture your computer, but they also provide technical support, so there's a lot more service. Carpenters and welders make things, but they really they provide a service, so there's a, a wide mixture of goods and services. Fast food is mostly service, but they do hand you a hamburger, french fries, and a soda, so they manufacture those. Car repair is mostly service, but there's a little bit of manufacturing involved. And services like education and the dentist are pure services. We produce goods, and we deliver services. When we produce goods, we have a tangible output. We have something that we can hold in our hand. Delivery of a service is an act. A barber cutting your hair, a dentist cleaning your teeth. Services can be categorized into some broad categories. Government, wholesale retail, financial services, health care, personal care, business services, and education. Let's talk about the key differences between manufacturing and service. Let me point out to you that these are averages. These are typical there are exceptions to every one of the items I'm going to tell you. In terms of customer contact, how much the company interfaces with the customer, that tends to be low with manufacturing and high with services. When you buy a car from Honda, you're at the dealership for an hour or two and you've got your car. When you go out to a restaurant to eat, you're dealing with a waiter or waitress off and on throughout your entire meal. In terms of inputs with goods, they tend to be very uniform. Honda, when it buys its tires or its transmissions or whatever they buy, they have very specific specifications, and every one they buy meets those specifications. 
a restaurant, for example, buys agricultural products, which there is no uniformity to. In terms of labor content, it tends to be low in manufacturing and high in services. In terms of uniformity of output, it tends to be high in manufacturing. Every car of the same model that Honda makes looks about the same, maybe a different color or different features, but it's virtually the same. Uh, services, there is a much lower level of uniformity of outputs. With manufacturing, as I've said earlier, it's tangible outputs. You can hold it in your hands. With services, it is somewhat to mostly intangible, depending on the, the mixture of service and manufacturing. So in a fast food restaurant, you can hold the food in your hand, so it's not completely intangible. It is fairly easy to measure productivity in manufacturing. How many cars did you make today? It is more difficult in services. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. Think about a doctor's office. If you see a bunch of people with uh, headaches and uh, bruises and things like that, you can go through them pretty quickly. You can have a high amount of output. If you're seeing heart attacks and other difficult types of cases, the doctor is going to be able to see a lot fewer patients. So just measuring the number of patients isn't a very good measure of productivity. With manufacturing, it's easy to correct problems. If you find it anywhere on the assembly line or even after it's in finished goods inventory, you can fix it. With services, because the customer is there, there's less opportunity to correct the problem at least before the customer sees it. We tend to have a lot of inventory with manufacturing, as you might well imagine. There tends to be much less inventory with services. Some services have practically no inventory, but most of them have some inventory. Evaluating things like productivity, quality, uh, is much easier in manufacturing because of the uniformity of inputs and outputs. Because the less uniformity of inputs and outputs in services, it tends to be much harder. We can perhaps protect our product with a patent in manufacturing. It is not usually possible to have any sort of intellectual property protection with services. Some of the topics included in operations management, and remember this is an overview of a survey course, so we're jumping around. Forecasting, capacity planning, scheduling, managing inventories, assuring quality, motivating employees, deciding where to locate facilities, supply chain management, and much more. And of course, let me point out that not every course covers all of these topics. So no matter where you're taking operations management, you're not going to hit every one of these topics just because there's not time. So why should you study operations management? In my classes, the students tell me the number one reason is because it's required to get their degree. But besides that, uh, every aspect of the business is affected by or affects operations management. Marketing can't sell products if you don't make them. You can't forecast products if you don't make them. Many service jobs are closely related to operations, so they have a lot of the characteristics of operations. Financial services, marketing services, accounting services, and information services tend to be much more operations type than service types. There's a significant amount of interaction and collaboration among the functional areas. Remember, we talked about the four functional areas earlier. So even if you're in marketing, you need to understand operations. And, and in fact, one of the things that you will get a lot from operations is what's called available to promise. And we'll talk about that in the later chapter. Operations also helps us understand the world around us, especially when we talk about the reasons for outsourcing and the reasons for offshoring. Let's look at one operations job, the industrial production manager. This could be a like a plant manager at a plant, or it could be one level below the plant manager. For this job, the average annual wages is $113,000. That's pretty good. Only 10% of the people having this job earn less than $63,000. That's really good. We employ about 181,000 of these in this country, even though a lot of our production has been offshored. And in terms of the list of 100 top paying jobs that you see the citation for on the screen, it was number 51. That's not bad. You see a graph on the screen showing the growth in service jobs, which is where most of you will likely be working when you graduate and the steady state of manufacturing jobs. And really, if you look at um, everything in detail in the last few years, they're kind of declining. So why the decline in manufacturing jobs? Most students immediately jump to outsourcing offshoring, and that is a reason. But a bigger reason is increase in productivity. An increase in productivity means that you're doing more with less. You're making more output with less workers. So that doesn't lower your output, but it does lower your labor content, which is what we looked at in the uh, last slide. Outsourcing and offshoring certainly cause the decline as well. You can just send it to a company that can do it more efficiently than you do. And that will cut jobs, but increase productivity and therefore reduce manufacturing jobs. So, for example, I know a company that makes uh, ice crampons, the uh, cleats that strap on a shoe so you can walk on ice. They don't do their own heat treating. They outsource that to another company in the same area 
So it's not sent overseas, but they outsource it to another company to do the heat treatment because the other company can do it much more effectively than they can. Manufacturing still matters for this country. There are some jobs that will always be done here and they can't be moved overseas for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about later. But we still have 18 million workers in manufacturing jobs in this country. Those workers and those outputs account for 70% of the value of the exports of this country. They tend to have higher compensation than average, about 20% higher. They're not gig jobs. They're more likely to have benefits. Productivity is growing more rapidly than the rest of the economy. So we're getting more output for uh, less input, making those jobs more profitable. Even when work is outsourced or offshored overseas, the R&D work is done here. Manufacturing workers in California, for example, earn an average of about $25,000 a year more than service workers. And there's the multiplier effect. If you lose a manufacturing job in California, about two and a half service jobs are lost as well because the worker doesn't have money to go out and eat at restaurants and buy nice stuff that are, is supported. Now let's get more specific about definitions. Outsourcing is just moving to another company. So for example, the last school that I taught at before this one didn't run their own bookstore. They outsourced it to another company, Barnes & Noble, I think, but I'm not sure. So that is outsourcing. American workers still worked in the bookstore, still sold the books. It was just not done by the university. It was done by another company. They had their own cleaning crew to come in and clean the offices during the day, but they hired an outside company to come in at night and clean the classrooms, outsourcing. We call it offshoring when we move production to another country. So Apple offshores the production of its iPhones to China. All offshoring is outsourcing, but not all outsourcing is offshoring. In other words, not all outsourcing causes loss of American jobs. So companies can offshore. I've already mentioned Apple producing their iPhones in China. Dell offshoring a service to a call center in India to do their technical support. It is also true that consumers can offshore. I had a student one time from Mexico who needed a root canal. He told me that it was cheaper for him to fly back to Mexico, visit his family, get the root canal done by a Mexican dentist, and fly back to school than it was to get it done in the U.S. That's offshoring. In this case, offshoring the dentistry. American consumers can also buy foreign products that are cheaper than American products. Basically, in that case, it is the American offshoring the production of whatever product they're buying. We've been talking about manufacturing, but it is challenging managing a service as well. Service jobs are oftentimes much less structured than manufacturing jobs. For reasons we'll talk about later, if you go to a manufacturing company and say, what are you going to be making next Monday at 842, they can probably tell you. If you go to a service manager and say, what are you going to be doing in the next two hours, they probably don't know because customers come in and just change uh, what's going on and the importance of various jobs. The high customer contacts makes managing services more difficult. You tend to have lower skilled level workers. Not always, but in a lot of cases. And it is always more difficult to manage workers with lower skills. Also, many service jobs hire entry-level workers who don't have experience in the job market. That makes managing them much more difficult. As I mentioned earlier, their inputs are more variable, which makes the job harder. And because of the high labor content, the way the worker is feeling can have much more of an impact on how the service is delivered than it would in a manufacturing environment. There are ethical issues in operations management, and these will be woven into the various discussions that we have. There are issues around the financial statement, although not many. Worker safety, product safety, quality, and that's a big one. Environmental, community, hiring and laying off workers, closing facilities, and workers' rights. Operations interfaces with a lot of other areas in the company. The more obvious ones are marketing, purchasing, for an American manufacturing firm, for example, 60% of cost of goods sold is purchased. So that's done by the purchasing department. There's distribution. There's maintenance. And by maintenance, I don't mean cleaning up. I mean maintaining the machines. The less obvious ones are legal, accounting, personnel, industrial engineering, your computer department, and your public relations department. This introduction will be continued in part two. If you like this, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel.